go into our reading for today. Um, and doing so, we welcome our online members who join us at this point in the service. It's 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, my mistake. We've been busy with Thessalonians now for a week or two. We've got a good idea of the context, what the place was like. Um, and today, Paul shares a very, I think, personal piece of information, not just with the Thessalonians, but also with us. So, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 13. You remember our labor and toil, brothers and sisters. We worked night and day so that we might not be a burden on any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how pure, upright, and blameless our conduct was towards you believers. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you would lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We also constantly give thanks to God for this, that when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is, God's word, which is also at work in you believers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A difficult piece of scripture to, to I think, make a sermon about because Paul is not really giving us direction. He's not really giving any instruction in this piece. Rather, he is sharing his story with the Thessalonians and also with us. Last week, when we left Paul and the Thessalonians, the, uh, the first few verses of chapter 2, he was defending himself against the rumors that he wasn't really an apostle. He was just a traveling preacher who used some fancy words to extort people, to get money out of them. He says in, in, in the preceding piece, that's not the case. You yourselves know that, 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 that I and my companions lived good lives, we were good examples of faith for you. And here he continues building on that. Just go back to that reading for a second, Doug. He includes them in what he's saying. You remember our labor and our toil. He's not saying to them um, what he did. He's saying, you remember that we did these things. Our labor and our toil. That we worked. We had day jobs so that we could earn money so that we would not be a burden on you or so that you would not feel you had to pay us for proclaiming the gospel. And in fact... There's a piece later when he talks about his labor again, Paul, which if you read it in the Greek, actually translates as, you saw the sweat on our bodies as we worked. That's how hard we worked, so we would not be a burden for any of you. We came to you not to burden you financially or spiritually or physically or emotionally. We came to you so that we could proclaim the gospel of Christ. And verse 10 you are witnesses, and God also, how pure and upright and blameless our conduct was toward you believers. In other words, unlike the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, we didn't say one thing and do another. You, you get those preachers who say, um, do what I tell you, don't, don't do what I do. Have you, have you heard that one before? Coaches who say, do what I say, don't do what I do. And Paul is saying, there are two kinds of teachers in faith. There are ones who give you a list of commandments, but they never lift a finger. And then there are the ones who teach you by example. And we have been an example. How to live pure and upright and blameless lives before you and before our God. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children. Now, last week, Paul said, I was to you like a mother nursing her own children. And here he says, and I was to you like a father 
instructing his own children. It's a beautiful image of the life of faith and of instruction in faith. How we need the nursing of a mother and the direction and the nurturing of a father to really grow into maturity of faith. Urging and encouraging and pleading with you to lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and his own glory. And then verse 13, I think the verse that we'll, that we'll try and focus on today. We also constantly give thanks to God for this. That when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is. God's word, which is also at work in you believers. The word Paul uses there, logos, God's word, is closely related to the English logic. And there's something in, in that translation, logos to logic, which should remind us or which should tell us this is more than just the word of God, as if God is speaking and everything just happens. What Paul is saying is God's word, God's logos, God's logic is more than just words and sounds and syllables. It is the thinking of God. It is the plan of God. It is the rationale of God which you have accepted. That is what your conversion hinges on. It's not that we told you some fancy words and you became convinced. It's that you accepted the logic and the reasoning of the gospel as your own. And you have devoted your lives to it. And, and in a moment, we'll discuss the pitfalls of that thinking as well. Of, 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 of the trap of turning the gospel into a solely intellectual exercise as if we just need to grasp the logic and then we'll be okay but just for the moment let's return to the context of Thessalonica big city important city the capital of the eastern part of the old Greek empire now under Roman control a harbor city so many different cultures influences religions and a strong Jewish community to whom Paul goes in the first place. And Paul and Silvanus and Timothy start preaching there in the synagogue. And they get a few people, some of the Jewish people, who start following them and accept this logic of God and become followers of Christ. And they get a few Greek people who also hear what they're teaching and say, yes, we also become convinced by that logic of God and we want to be followers of Christ. And just as this community starts to find its feet, the people in the synagogue, the remaining Jews, launch an attack on Paul and his companions. A scathing persecution. And Paul and his companions flee for their lives. And they go to Athens and then they go to Corinth. But Paul is so concerned about the people he's left behind, this new fledgling church, that he sends Timothy back with a letter to go find out how are they doing? Are they okay? Are they keeping the faith? Or are they lost? Are they confused? Have they gone back to their old ways? And Timothy comes back, he finds Paul in Corinth, and he says they're doing so well. They have kept your teachings so dutifully. So I have a few questions. They've got some things that they struggle with, which we'll get to later in the book. But overall, they are a model of faith. And last week's chapter, last week's reading ended with Paul saying, we didn't just give you the gospel. We gave you ourselves in love. We didn't just rock up in your town and put up a tent and put up a big sound system and expect you to come hearing a message. We came and we lived among you as your own people. And we weren't a burden to you at any stage. And we didn't just give you the words of the gospel. We gave you our own lives. That's how much we loved you. And, and the image Paul uses for this is the image of a mother nursing a child. That's 
is how we cared for you, is what Paul is saying. And here he takes that image further and he says, our love for you extended as far as a love of a father extends to his children. A father who nourishes and nurtures and encourages and at times pleads and as we can imagine at times disciplines as well. The love that Paul and the apostles had for these first churches is something incredibly complex and at the same time so simple and so beautiful. And their conversion, their walk in the path of Christ began not with the apostles giving them fancy words, but sharing their lives. Because if you truly love someone, you give yourself to them. And if you truly love them for their sake, you make demands of them for their growth and their health and their well-being. We often think, I suppose, when, you, when, you're, uh, when you're younger, you think, oh, if my parents really love me, they'd let me do what I want. Um, but of course, l love is the opposite. Love, love is loving you so much that I don't let you do what you want. Love is loving you so much that I make demands of you which you might not understand. And that is the love that Paul is expressing for these people. And from that love, from that wellspring of love, he gives them verses 12 and 13, urging, encouraging, and pleading with you to lead a life worthy of God. And next week we'll see what he means, talking about sexual relations, talking about how they treat each other, talking about legal issues. We also constantly, verse 13, give thanks to God for this. That when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as what it really is. God's word, which is also at work in you believers. We don't have the Bible on the table today. Because we often take the Bible, this collection of old books written over hundreds, sometimes thousands of years, and we treat it as the words about God. And certainly they are words about God. In the Bible, we have the story of God with people, of God choosing people, even though they don't deserve it, and entering into covenant with them, and even though they break the covenant, God keeps on coming back and keeps on forgiving and keeps on giving His goodness again. And this culminates in the giving of His Son and His Son's ministry and death and resurrection and ascension and the pouring out of the Spirit and the growth and the, and the, and the flourishing of the church. But those are the words about God. And in a certain sense, that's what Paul and Silvanus and Timothy were proclaiming. They came into Thessalonica and they told the story. They explained the human logic. Why Jesus is the Messiah that the Jews had expected. Why in his crucifixion and his resurrection, he had reconciled the whole world, Jews and Greeks and Romans and all the Gentiles and men and women and slaves and owners and children and old people and everyone to himself so that everyone is now part of God's family. They, 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 they spoke human words. They spoke the words about God. And the Spirit was moving and at work in those people and the Spirit turned the words about God into the Word of God itself. And that's the difference. And I think we all have these moments in faith where the story becomes our story. 
where the words about God that you read become the word of God for you in that moment. Now, that's not something logical. That's not something that you can achieve by reasoning about it. That is the Spirit working, Jesus will say, well, John will say, as the Spirit will, when the Spirit will, as the wind blows. And the reformers, the guys uh, 500 years ago, who broke away from the Catholic Church and decided to make again uh, the, the, the Word of God, the Bible as it is, the words about God and the Word of God, to make that the primary source of revelation about God. They knew that in keeping the sacraments, in keeping communion and baptism, in celebrating the sacraments, we celebrate the Word becoming flesh, the logic becoming real, the logos becoming more than just an intellectual exercise where we read the Bible, but becoming truly for each of us salvation and forgiveness and grace. And in a certain sense, these parts of Paul's letters are the best ones to preach about. Because he's not giving people a list of commandments. He's not saying, if you do A, B, C, and D, then you will be okay in God's eyes. He's simply saying, when we came to you, all we did is we told the story. And the Spirit did the rest. And thanks be to God for that. And so what we'll do now is we will acknowledge that the Spirit is still working. And working here and working now. When we break the bread and take the cup. Because when Jesus sat down with his disciples, he took bread and he broke it and he said, take and eat. This is my body. And after he had given them the bread, he took the cup and he said, take and drink. This is my blood. And remember, remember that all the words about God will become for you the Word of God. And all the thoughts about God will become for you the logic of God. And that because God has given and dispensed upon us His grace and His mercy, we are included in the story. God makes us part of His people, whether we be Jews, Gentiles, or young, or old, or slaves, or free. And so, we will, we, we will say the words as we celebrate communion together, and then when it comes five time for communion, Hillary and, I, Hillary and I will prepare the table, and then remember, we'll go from the first row, first uh, receive communion, second row, middle row, second to last, and then the last row. And all the while, you'll hear the words of our communion song play. So, let us, uh, this time, I will say the parts in yellow, and you will say the parts in white. The Lord be with you. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Come to the table, and in receiving a small piece of bread, and a small sip of wine, of juice. Be reminded that human words have become for us the word of God. And the words about God have become for us the word of God 
in this moment. My love. 